So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another Clear Mountain Monastery interview. We're so happy to have Ajahn Sona uh, back with us for our, I think it's our fourth interview with you. Um, certainly over two. Um, so yeah, thank you, Donna John, for being back with us. It's always delightful, gentlemen. Um, we have great conversations. You all are quite fluent and uh, bright and so, and it's great that we can talk this way. Uh, one of the ways that I prefer to do things is to be asked questions. It's always easier. Giving Dhamma talks, you have to just, you know, you're going to talk for the next 45 minutes to an hour right off the top of your head. It's quite a challenge, actually. But answering questions is much, uh, is much more comfortable format. Yeah. We do have uh, quite a few questions. I'm going to, if it was okay, I'll just read a quick biography for anyone who doesn't yet know you. Um, sure. We can get to meet you. Uh, so this is Ajahn Sona, who is the founder of and abbot of Birkin Monastery. Born in Canada in 1954, Ajahn Sona's background was as a classical guitarist. His encounter with Buddhist wisdom as a young man initiated a spiritual journey that led him to become a lay hermit in the coast mountain region of British Columbia for several years. He subsequently ordained as a Theravada monk in 1989 under Bhante Gunaratana at the Bhavana Society in West Virginia, where his first years of training took place. Ajahn Sona further trained for another three plus years at monasteries in the Ajahn Chah tradition in Northeast Thailand, especially Wat Banana Chat, the international monastery. Upon his return to Canada in 1994, he helped found the original Birkin Forest Monastery in Pemberton, British Columbia, and as its spiritual guide, um, served in that role. So through several incarnations, he has since led Birkin Monastery, also known by its Pali name Sitavana, translated as Cool Forest Grove, through to its current and final resting place in a secluded, fully off-grid forest location just south of Canloops, British Columbia. And I just, this is a special note. So with over 30 years in the robes, uh, Ajahn Sona is now referred to as Lumpur by his closest disciples. So is that Okay, if we call you Lumpur Sona? As you wish, as you wish, yes. That's an informal title uh, that the Thais use, um, meaning Venerable Father, and I guess I'm old enough to be a, a daddy by now. I'm 69 years old, and coming up on my 35th reigns, if, uh, <laughs> if I'm not old enough. Most, you know, it's only recently that people lived this long, you know? So I don't know what the Thai monks must have, being called Lung Po when they were 45 years old before because they didn't live that long in the, you know, a, a century ago. <laughs> now, now we live longer. <laughs> yeah. Well, Lung Po, if I can uh, launch into uh, one of the questions. We've, in previous interviews, spoken about the resonance between the Greek world and the Buddhist and some of the connections you've found and fleshed out. And I know recently you've been looking into uh, deeper into that and maybe even working on a, a paper specifically on the role of Greek monks in writing down the suttas. And d do you mean Greek Buddhist monks? And would you tell us a little bit about this, uh, this whole realm of research? Yes, but first I'm going to read a quote to you. Um, by Plato. Now, if I didn't tell you this was Plato, and I made you guess, let's, let's see. This is from the Phaedo. This is a, a discourse written down by Plato. So, when at death the soul is free from reincarnation, it passes into the realm of the pure and everlasting and immortal and changeless, and being of a kindred nature, when it is once independent and free from interference, consorts with it always and strays no longer, but remains in the realm of the absolute, constant, and invariable. Quote, <laughs> that's from Plato. <laughs> uh, people rarely understand that uh, how close the, the mind state of of Greece in the fifth century BC was, especially amongst these legendary uh, philosophers, Socrates and Plato, that that was their preoccupation. And 
the immortal is the deathless. You know, that's that's Amara, that's Amara, the deathless, that which so they're 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 moving toward they're trying to solve this issue, this problem. So it's um when Greeks go to India, they're not shocked at all by the thought processes that are going on in India. Yeah, so my project, my, the larger project, first of all, is that I've always been, I've always wondered about how much these different cultures knew about each other, how much transmission of information between cultures was. And then, and, and what I was interested in was influence from India back to the Greek uh, uh, civilization. And then how, you know, how much effect did it have on the Stoics? How much effect did it have on Jesus, on, on Christ? I mean, how, was he familiar with uh, uh, Indian ideas? You know, you have this whole idea that Jesus went to India, but he probably didn't go... He went probably to the corner cafe and talked with people who were familiar with uh, Buddhist ideas, <laughs> what happened. <laughs> but in the opposite direction, we rarely talk about it, but it's, it's not even uh, hard to find, of course, that Greeks uh, entered into northern India, of course, at, at, um, with, with um, Alexander the Great, Alexander, by the way, wasn't Greek. He was Macedonian. Macedonia is a country just north of, of Greece. And he was a... Uh, eventually, they, they uh, conquered the, the Greeks and of, and, of course, the Persians. So the, the first large empire, which stretched from Greece, Macedonia, Egypt, all the way to, to India and had very advanced and developed uh, forms of uh, information and communication. Uh, and a, uh, they had conquered everything, which is the Persians. So this is a well-established trans-continental trans, uh, kind of uh, empire. It's about 4,500 miles across. And... So the Persians, by the way, had already been intertwined with, uh, with northern India. When we think of, the problem is we, we think of India as, as this country, you know, and we think of Persia or Iraq and Iran as countries and Afghanistan as countries, they, but this is just a, a later development. It was a, an amorphous blob, what it really was, and it leaked into each other's territories uh, various uh, cultures moved in and slowly uh, merged or or kept a separate uh, kind of separate peace um, and and or tension with the next uh, village over etc so this is the world of of the time of the Buddha and and before so what we have is that the Greeks, and the Persians were very interested in other cultures. They really were interested. And the thing that they were interested in was also writing everything down. So now I want to read another uh, encounter. This is from Socrates. These are old concerns, of course. Socrates questioned the use of writing, recorded, ironically, by Plato <laughs> in writing, <laughs> worrying that, quote, if men learn this, that is writing, it will implant forgetfulness in their souls. They will cease to exercise memory because they rely on that which is written, calling things to remembrance, no longer from within themselves, but by means of external marks. Then this person who is quoting this says, I think the trade-off here was worth it. I am, after all, a writer, but it was a trade-off. Human beings really did lose faculties of memory we once had. Now, this is their preoccupation. And just scroll up a little more, Meta. Wait, wait. Go up a little more. I want to read from, this is the, 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 the Old Testament when it was put into Greek. So here's the, here's about the time that the scriptures, the Buddhist scriptures were probably being written down. Uh, 
this is how the influence of the Greeks across that ancient world. So this is this is the Old Testament, the Hebrew Testament, the seven books of the Hebrew Testament. So there's the significance of the Septuagint, this the seven books translation can hardly be overestimated. Following the conquests of Alexander the Great, 336 to 323 BC, Greek became the official language of Egypt as well, Syria and the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. The seven-book translation made the Hebrew scriptures available both to the Jews who no longer spoke their ancestral language and to the entire Greek-speaking world. The Old Testament was later to become the, quote, Bible of the Greek-speaking early church and is frequently quoted in the New Testament. So this was forced. The translation was forced. They, they said, we are going to have your books translated because we're really interested in all books. And you must find scribes and translate them into Greek for us. This is, this is uh, within about 100 years of the time of the Buddha. So this is what the Greeks did wherever they were. And they didn't care whether it was Greek or anything like that. They wanted it in Greek and they wanted it written down. So this is the attitude that they would have had in India, North, Northern India and at the time. And of course, what we have is no secret. We have Greek monks were in the robes very early. They were interested in all kinds of um, uh, ideas and they were very persuaded by, um, by Buddhist ideas. And it was not an unusual thing for immigrants, which the Greeks were, to adopt the uh, local religions. And the Persians were the ones that made sure that uh, everybody's religion was tolerated. So when you, when you go into, when you look in Indian history, you see these Asokan pillars. Uh, you probably visited them. You were on a pilgrimage to India. Did you see some Asokan pillars? Yeah. Yes, we saw one in Bodh Gaya, or the replica at the least. Yeah. So those pillars were actually all over the Persian Empire. And they're called Asokan pillars, but Asoka was a rather later um, emperor. And he had had lots of contact, and the whole culture had lots of contact with the Persian Empire, which became the Greek Empire. And that's one of the ways they... It's a, it's a political statement that they had. They put a pillar in the center of the village squares and the city squares. And it said that at the time, it was Cyrus the Great, the, the, the Persian emperor. He said, we're not here to uh, molest your people or take over or uh, insult your religious ideas. All of these are, you're free to pursue those and uh, and we're respectful of these things. So we're what we're doing is just establishing a large and it'll be profitable for everybody, you know. So it was a way of managing an empire. Of course the the thing was that people could read in the in the Greek uh, village in the Greek Empire and the Persian Empire, reading was known. When it went to India, though, very few, there's no, in, there's, it, the, the evidence that, that anybody could read is very scanty. <laughs> However, they were just imitating that. So they carved these pillars. In the south, they're in a, a certain script, what's called Brahmi script, and uh, the local, they're in the local um, language. We call Pali, sort of, it's a Prakrit. This word Prakrit is, just really means um, vernacular, uh, the local language. And in the north, the, the pillars are actually in, uh, in a different script as well, Karosti. And it makes sense in the north because actually people could read, including the Greeks who were in the north. And the, the language of the Asokan pillars, now this would be what we would maybe call Afghanistan now. Uh, it's, 
in uh, Greek and Aramaic. So this would not be a shock at all to them uh, as it goes down to the south, more south in India, right, right, uh, reading and writing are just not on the table. Now, now do, you, do you remember this, this quote that I gave from Socrates? He's, he, they're already writing before Socrates. There's pre-Socratics that are writing and Socrates can read and write. He, he reads Heraclitus and these various things. But he's, uh, he's a little, uh, he knows there's going to be downsides to this. Uh, so that we're, we're going through this exact parallel right now with the internet, aren't we? Uh, I, New York Times was saying that the ability, attention capacity has gone down by 50% in the last like eight years. <laughs> They're measuring people a capacity to stay on a single topic and it's like 30 seconds is <laughs> how long it lasts. Um, so we're, we're, we're finding out what happens when you introduce a new medium, uh, this, this thing called the internet and uh, Google and so forth. And, and of course, we're just going into the AI, the, the who knows what's gonna happen with that. There's all kinds of predictions that could be gr grave re results for that, especially for younger people, right? So this, this was on the minds of people at the time in terms of this idea of writing. And in India, uh, of course, the, v the Vedas, the Brahmins, were the more or less the competitors to Buddhism. And they were very, very dead set against writing anything down. It had to be memorized very carefully because it's a guarded teaching. And what does the Buddha say about his teachings? He says, my teachings are not guarded. They're not secret teachings. I teach with an open hand. Anybody is welcome to uh, investigate these teachings. So they would have been in a culture that didn't use writing at the time and had to memorize. And there was another culture side by side, the Brahmanical cultures who had the Vedas. And they and they were insistent that this be a secret teaching only available to certain caste members. But the Buddha is, and his, the Sakyans and the other, and similar tr uh, tribes basically, uh, are not persuaded by the Vedas at all. They're not interested in, in the Brahmanic teachings and the Vedas. They've heard some of these things, but they're not, they're not buying it. So, but it's a memory culture. Uh, but uh, once the, the, Greek, the Greeks become into the robes, they know about writing. And there's no particular objection to this. Now, think about it even in modern times. Just imagine if I asked if I could recite the Patimokha, but if I could read it out instead of reciting it, say in Thailand or in the forest tradition in Thailand, if I um, my mind's, my memory's a little uh, uh, sketchy, but uh, I'll read it out instead. Is that all right with you? <laughs> you see, uh, now, of course, the audience who are listening to us don't know this, but there's a, there's a, a feature of the forest tradition, particularly, that the full recitation of the, uh, the, the, kind of the summary of the rules for monks, which takes about anywhere from 45 minutes, if you're really fast, to up to about an hour, um, to recite in Pali from memory. And it's a feature of this Vinaya or rules of conduct that it's to be recited for groups of monks every uh, fortnight on the full moon and the new moon. But it, there's a big feature that it, somehow it needs to be memorized. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, we do have a person sitting beside them who is actually reading along with them and making sure that they don't make a mistake but because they have the printed text. So even to this day, we have this kind of thing about, is this memory versus writing, you know? Are we, uh, uh, we, we really haven't sorted it out all, all that well. So anyway, this new medium is coming in and there would be some resistance probably. First of all, many monks could not read, but the, the Greeks could. 
Now, there's no evidence all the way down to Sri Lanka. Again, maybe the least evidence in Sri Lanka that there's any there was any reading uh, uh, available at the time. The, remember that the the uh, Ahsoka is the sending missionaries to uh, Sri Lanka, and Ahsoka is 250 BC. Now, Greek monks were in the robes before that. So Greek monks were in the robes. Now, Greeks are, by the way, not every, uh, this I'm talking to American audiences here as well, whose geography is not known for its, anything outside of um, the borders of the United States is quite often a very foggy issue for Americans, but the Greeks are Europeans. <laughs> so European monks, Western monks were in the robes before the time of Ahsoka and before uh, it went out to any other areas outside of India. So the West European monks were the second group uh, in the robes. Not uh, Sri Lankans, not Chinese, not Thais, not Burmese, not uh, least of all Tibetan and Japanese who are a thousand years later. So it's very early and this needs to be, I'm just interested in recovering the role of European monks in the earliest part of the Sangha and this absolutely inevitable thing called writing and how it affected the Dhamma. So this is, uh, I will, I've been speaking quite a while here, so I'll just let you have a word edgewise in here if you want to ask anything. <laughs> I'm happy to go on, but I'll, yeah, go on. Thank you, Lumpur. Um, this is fascinating. Is, is it common knowledge that the, is, is the knowledge that there were Greek monks uh, recent, or is that, um, you know, just has that been common knowledge for quite some time? And are any of your other inquiries coming out of uh, recent research, or is this these all clues that have been hidden around for quite a while and just the dots not connected? It, it's no one. Actually, I think if you talk to, say, Sri Lankan monks uh, who have, you know, exposure to well, in the Sri Lankan culture, Buddhist, Buddhism is the, is, the, is the national religion in a sense. And they're quite uh, educated on the history and so forth. And they, they are completely unsurprised. Uh, they know all about the Yavana monks. So in the suttas, uh, or no, rather in, in, the, in the suttas and commentaries, the Greeks are known as Yavana, Y-A-V-A-N-A, -A -A, Yavana which is some sort of variant of Ionian. Um, so this, they were known like that across, the, uh, across Asia as well. So um, I think Western people who are reading this are, part of it is we, we have, we're, we're prejudiced actually. We have, first of all, a romantic idea about Eastern religions. Uh, there's a book called... Uh, uh, what is it, is it De denizens of uh, Shangri-La or something? It's a, it's written by a professor, a Buddhist uh, professor, about people's Western people's attitude towards uh, Tibetan Buddhism and so forth. You know, it, it's exotic. It's interesting. In the old days, there was, in some ways, they were given special status. At the same time, that status was kind of like, oh, isn't that interesting what they can do, those Asians, you know. So we have to kind of get over this whole thing. Uh, you know, that Buddhism is a universal religion. It has nothing to do with countries, races, cultures, or anything like that. And it's, we have to uh, not prioritize or give special uh special status to any particular country or culture in this. So yes, the, the Greeks were there and that, and what we have is some interesting uh, evidence in the, what, there's two, two books that, to learn about uh, 
history in a sense. The earliest histories of Buddhism are the Deepavamsa and the Mahavamsa. These are two um, commentarial histories written by monks in Sri Lanka. And the Deepavamsa is probably first. Uh, Mahavamsa is a little larger uh, version of that filled in. And there we can find a history of some of the relationships there. So there, there you find the record of, now this is, sound, this is probably exaggeration, and there is a lot of exaggeration, especially with numbers in the commentaries and suttas. Here you find uh, that 30,000 Greek monks, Yavana monks, came to, uh, tam- came to a ceremony at, in Sri Lanka from India. 30,000. <laughs> now, I don't believe that. <laughs> I mean, I, I believe that the Greek monks came. I don't believe that 30,000 came. You know, when you read these suttas, this, they use words like 80 or numbers like 84,000. There were eight, Ahsoka made 84,000 monasteries. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, uh, the, the, the number, their sense of numbers, it's like we say there's tons of such and such. There's millions, you know, gazillions. It's just a, a way of talking about large numbers. But it's very, it's very clear that they were fully aware of these. Now, what's interesting is that the, 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 the f- most famous of these Greek monks were famous for something. And what they were famous for was Pati Sambida, uh, Kovilo. What does that mean? Maybe analytical knowledge? Aha, mm-hmm. uh-huh, yes. Analytical knowledge, which would have been, of course, in line with the Greek tradition, but also in line with writing. Rather than the sutta transmission uh, and the stories of the Vinaya. So the Vinaya is the rules of conduct for monks, and there's a lot of how do they preserve these rules? They tell stories about how the rules were formed, and it's easier to remember that. But there's another uh, section of the, the Tapitaka called the Abhidhamma, and there are commentaries which will probably, maybe er, before the Abhidhamma was Patisambhida. So there's a, a little commentary called Patisambhida Maga, which you can see that this Maga word is applied to the Vimuti Maga later on, and then the Visudhi Maga, the path of analysis, Patisambhida Maga, the path of analysis, the path of liberation, the path of purification. These are analytical types of works and much more conducive to writing than memorization. They, they, they're not story things. They're, they're a lot of, uh, they're, they're chemistry tables, they're, they're uh, analytical phrases and so forth. Just uh, reductionism is what it is. It's like typical of Greek science as well. This, is, this particularly happens when you go from memory to writing. Writing allows this. So they become the, the masters, the Greek monks. So let's put up another quote here, Metta. Um, uh, this particular Buddhist monk so is named Dhamma Rakita or Rakshita. So here is a a quote. In another Pali reference, a Buddhist monk from Sri Lanka named Punabha Suku Tambika Puta Tissa (laughs) Tara, (laughs) he's a a Tara, (laughs) is said to have been to India in order to study with the Yonaka, this is the another word for the Greek, Yonaka or Yavana, Dhamma Rakita, whereupon he attained the, quote, Patisambhida, analytical knowledge. Um, this is in the Vibhanga commentary. So this Sri Lankan monk 
goes to India to study with a Greek monk. The place where Dhammarakita resides is also said to be about 100 leagues, 700 miles from Sri Lanka, putting him somewhere in northern India. So this is uh, Dhammarakita. Okay, so that's... Dhammarakita is the main guy who... um, I think may be responsible for a lot of the written and Abhidhamma things. He's, he's an Abhidhamma scholar and he's Greek. And so this is where it ties in. The Greeks, because they, the first thing they would have done and almost, perhaps even being insisted upon, even by the government, is that they write the Dhamma down. The Greeks were very interested in accumulating all the writing uh, that they could. And they still had power in, the, in northern India. And uh, there would have been, it wouldn't be been forced, it would just be part of the tradition that we, we accumulate all of the uh, valuable information we can in, in writing so that we can, uh, first of all, get it back to our libraries. So the Greeks were obsessed by libraries. You see the great library of Alexandria, northern Egypt. They wanted to collect all of the possible books in the world, and they had a huge collection of them. And these were, and many of them were, they had copies of them, so they weren't just one copy of each. There are kind of uh, exaggerated uh, evaluations of how many books, so-called books, they had there, but probably... Uh, There were 10 copies of each book, you know, it was a large library. So this is, um, this is probably where it starts. Now, where do we, when you, as monks or as lay people, casual readers of Buddhist history and including uh, maybe the, the myth, uh, cultural myths in Sri Lanka, where, where people ask, when was the, the teachings of the Buddha first written down? It's a very interesting kind of, this is because of Christian history. When was the New Testament written down and where and so forth? And so this is the scholastic look at things, a historian's look. Where was the Pali Canon uh, written down? When, was it written by the Buddha? No. When? Well, it's supposed to have been written in Sri Lanka. And it's uh, commemorated. So I, I've, I've had this in my head for 40 years. You know, this is standard knowledge. It's it was written down in Sri Lanka. I, tell, I used to say it all the time. It was written down in the first century BC. It's, you know, it was this big gather. Well, who knows what it was? So I, I, I think, where, uh, where did this, wh- who said this and where is it found and so forth? Well, it's in the, it's one sentence in the Deepavamsa and one sentence in the Mahavamsa. It's on page like 228, <laughs> almost at the end. One sentence. It says, and then the monks decided it was, uh, things were getting shaky with the memory and support and so forth, and they decided to write the entire canon down. The end. One sentence about this major event in history, the complete recording of the Pali Canon. It's this at the uh, Alu Vihara in uh, Sri Lanka. Have you been to Sri Lanka, gentlemen? Have you been to the Alu Vihara? I've been to Sri Lanka, but never there. Ajahn? Yeah. It's just, uh, it's preserved there. It's quite interesting. It's uh, it's very ancient, obviously, and uh, usually there's a monk there that shows you how how they wrote on these uh, ola leaves and how it's they inscribe it with this kind of brass stylus and and put some powder on it and then blow it off and it it looks like writing and so forth this it's hard to imagine that this major event was not more spectacularly remembered and recorded as just a casual sentence or two so I think certainly that I'm sure it, something happened there, but I don't think it was the first time the, the Pali Canon got set down. 
And of course, we know that there are birch bark scrolls found only in the mid 1990s, and they're in the British Museum, and they're in, I think they're in Norway. The Thais seem to have gotten a hold of some of them, and they're at the University of Washington, <laughs> just near you guys. <laughs> I uh, intend to go and examine these with my, with my eyes and talk to the professor there, Richard Solomon, who has translated these things and has some very interesting comments to make about them too. But they're dated to about the time that this great transcription of the Pali Canon is supposed to have taken place in Sri Lanka. But where do these birch bark scrolls come from? They come from what we would call Afghanistan now, northern India. And what, uh, what script, so this is the big deal I've been having to research for months and months and months. I have to look into scripts, Indian scripts. What, what, how did they write it? In what script were things written? And these are written in what's called Karusti, not Brahmi, Karusti. And so this Karusti script is analyzed by Richard Solomon. And this is a common, seemed to be uh, common across uh, the Middle East as well. It's close to the Semitic scripts that we have, like the, the Greek alphabets and so forth. It's close to them. I think Meta maybe can put up a quote for me. Karosti includes only one standalone vowel character, which is used for initial vowels in words. Other initial vowels use the A character modified by diacritics. Using epigraphic evidence, Salomon, so this is Richard Salomon at the University of Washington. He's a professor emeritus now, I think, maybe even uh, retired. He's the one that analyzed these scriptures. Solomon has established that the vowel order is A-E-I-O-U. Uh, does that ring a bell for, for you gentlemen? Uh, A-E-I-O-U and sometimes Y? <laughs> At least that was part of my education in terms of the order of the vowels. Akin to Semitic scripts rather than the usual vowel order for Indic scripts, A-I-U-E-O. So that Indic scripts have a different vowel order. Also, there is no differentiation between long and short vowels in Karosti. Both are marked using the same vowel markers. The alphabet was used in Gandharan Buddhism as a mnemonic for remembering a series of verses on the nature of phenomena. The script is Karosti. The language is Gandharan, and Gandhara is way up north, Prakrit. Pali is a Prakrit. There's about six Prakrits. Pali is around this, this language that Magadha, you know, Magadha or Pali, etc., is a Prakrit. And there's about six variant, variants of it. Uh, this Gandharan Prakrit is what the Greek monks would have used. Uh, they would have spoken Greek as well. But it shows you that we the only we don't have any uh, trace of the writing of it in on aloe leaves, uh, sorry ola leaves, uh, in uh, the, in Sinhalese or anything like that. We have none preserved. Uh, the the oldest ones are probably six hundred years ago. Uh, ola leaf transcriptions of the Pali Canon in Sinhalese and so forth. We don't have we don't have anything before six hundred. Um, no doubt they, they did this, but it's, it doesn't exist. This is such a freakish find that in 1995, they find birch bark scrolls in these containers in a desert area in north of India. And it's been preserved all this time. And it's the earliest dated Buddhist scriptures that we have. There are no earlier ones. 
The Asokan pillars are 250 BC, but they're not the Pali Canon. They're, they're just praise for the, the teachings of the Buddha and so forth. There's, um, there's, there's praise for, the, for Dhamma and so forth, but it's not the scriptures. This is the early scriptures we have, and it's way up north. And guess who would have likely uh, propagated that? And th those would be those would be uh, about four hundred years after the Buddha. It's entirely feasible that Greek monks would have written these things three hundred and fifty years before that, and so we just don't have them because nothing. You know, these things don't last unless they're preserved in a very specific kind of container. But that's the earliest uh, Buddhist writing uh, that we have, uh, and it's in that script, and it's from that region. So it's much more likely that these things were all written out uh, substantially, and that uh, Indian monks and, and Sri Lankan monks, once, once Sri Lanka got the Dhamma, they went up to study with these Greek scholar monks. And they realized, oh, they, they have them all written down and they preserve it that way. They were from a culture that preserved by memory and that the idea of writing them all down was not a big thing. But at, at some point, it began to fall apart because the Tapitaka is a huge collection, as you know. It's just, you can imagine trying to sustain that by memory. How, how would you do that? It's a monstrous uh, task to do that. So they realized that we better, we better get, we have to get these things written down because things are falling apart. Now, who, who has these things? Uh, it, up north, they have probably have a probably a, a complete collection or substantial amounts of written, uh, written texts, including this thing, this Abhidhamma and this Patisambhida. So they would have, th those things particularly are conducive to writing rather than memorization. So this is the important uh, feature of, of European monks entering the Sangha very early. And the resultant is they're bringing this written version to it. And it changes your mind, as Socrates warned. This is a very useful thing. This marks outside of your mind that substitute for your internal memory, but there's going to be a reduction in m memory capacity as well. It has a, a another side to it. So this is this is very this is important Buddhist history. Uh, it's not it's not obscure either. These uh, Buddhist monks. Uh, Greek Buddhist monks were are recorded on the Asokan pillars, by the way, as, as having been missionaries sent out of India to these foreign places to spread the Dhamma. And these they're they're known as Greek monks. So it's not there's nothing esoteric about this. These 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 are well recorded, but it's just washed over, and we just we don't have this as part of our history. So I'm just interested in restoring the reality that European monks were in the robes a long, long time ago. Uh, we are as, European monks are as old as, as any uh, Buddhist structures. We, you, you and you and me are not weirdos. We have, our, this tradition has been around in the West for forever, <laughs> before Christianity. Before Christianity, yes. Tony John, this is so fascinating. I'm curious. Uh, I hadn't thought about this question until hearing you you talk about this, but um, you know, it makes me think. You know, why didn't the Buddha um, lay out a rule uh, or, or say anything about writing? I mean, the word likati, which is the the verb to write, it does occur in the Pali Canon. It occurs in rather late places. It occurs in the Vinaya. Nice. So someone could make an argument that. You know, it was just later generations who are describing, you know, in relation to how you can lie. You know, you can lie by writing. But I'm curious, like, you know, the Buddha presumably would have been able to envision this new tech, new-ish, you know, technology. And the fact that there isn't a specific rule, at least, that comes down to us 
I think is is somewhat interesting. And I'm curious, I mean, I remember, yeah, Socrates in uh, the Phaedrus, as, as you were mentioning, just going so hard against how, you know, writing and reading would ruin people's memories. And uh, I, it, it seems somewhat curious to me I, that I had thought about it before that the Buddha, you know, um, that he wouldn't have mentioned it or, or, you know, preemptively forbid it, but maybe just uh, it didn't come up. So he didn't. There was nothing to forbid. They, I, I really, you can, the idea of writing is virtually unknown. However, now here's the other part, um, which is another interest of mine in that the Buddha's people, the Sakyans, are probably <laughs> Persian. <laughs> they're not, they're, they're, they're not first generation Persians, but they probably migrated from what we would call uh, Persia, uh, Iran, Iraq. Uh, there is a farming migration, farmers and warriors, so they're warriors. And that's why they are not uh, Brahmanical. They bring their own beliefs, and one of them is uh, they have a, a, an admiration for the sun and the, the, ch the wheel. So this whole Dhamma Chaka thing and the world ruling monarch, <clears throat> when you look at this um, Dhamma Raja, this world ruling monarch, what appears in the sky is this wheel. And it, by this, through this wheel goes across the sky and every, and this world ruling monarch is very charismatic and people, without war, they um, asked to sort of join the empire. And he, he's not just a country guy. He's not just ruling a country. He's not just a king. He's a world ruling, I mean an empire ruling. Now, who is the closest to this? This is the Persian Empire. This is Cyrus. He rules over. And how does he do it? Uh, people don't, they're not in a war. They, first of all, it's an overwhelming force, but they, and they're not there to just destroy that culture, uh, rob and uh, destroy. They're there to integrate it into the empire. So this whole idea of the world ruling emperor is, uh, is quite already taken place in history. And it's quite, uh, now with genetic studies as well, we, we see, now this is, very controversial in India, by the way. In, in, with, in certain, the right wing India is attempting to establish a, a nationalistic idea <clears throat> that India is a kind of a pure country. It's, it's rather racist, actually, is what it is. But they don't like this, the Aryan invasion. They don't like this idea that things came from outside of India. Uh, they are very uh, insistent that Sanskrit is a product of India. And it is obviously not a product of India. It is European and it comes into India and then is modified and, 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 and uh, brought to a very high state of things, but uh, it's also uh, kind of the language of the Vedas and so forth. But the... There are two so-called, and this is, we can see this only recently with genetic, uh, with DNA. So there is a, a, a fellow named David Reich who has written a book, Who We Are and Where We Came From. And this is just genetic studies available in the last seven years or so with better uh, DNA analysis. And they can see that when they take samples throughout India, they can see uh, generations of, that are brought from the steppes of Russia, what, what we call the, the Caucasus, the steppes of Russia, um, uh, through, through the Middle East, and they come in waves. So you can see layers of invasions in sense. These aren't really invasions necessarily. They're just, uh, things are not going well in a certain region, uh, ecological problems, and you move, you move east 
And there's a little tension with the people who are living there, but it's a very underpopulated area. And so you have an uneasy kind of truce. You, you intermarry sometimes. You send a princess over and so forth. You try to make peace. It's not good to who wants to go to war. But the, they tend to preserve their history and their background. So this is the Sakyans, the and, and uh, probably also the Jains were actually migrants from uh, the Middle East. And they did not uh, adopt the Brahmanical ideas, the Vedas. And so this is why you see this. They're, they're the Kshatriyas, the so-called warrior caste. And they're not having any of their, they're not fitting into the Brahmanical ideas about the castes. They say, no, no, thank you. Um, and we have our own way of looking at things. So this is, uh, you see this tension between the, the Buddha, the Buddha's teaching and the Brahmins. Uh, they're at the same time, they're, the Brahmins are not willing to uh, threaten them physically because there's a long standing like truce and tension here, you know, you, you, you're gonna start trouble. So, this is, uh, this is, they're importing some ideas and you can see it in the, in the Dhamma as well. These things are coming in. And of course, what's the history is, is an attitude as well is coming in. Um, and perhaps why the Buddha is saying, I, I don't have a secret teach. There's no esoteric teaching here. There's no secret teaching. It's, it's a public teaching. And he would not have resisted the idea of writing yeah, so it would have been, it, it's just, he would have been blended into Indian culture. There was no use for writing. They didn't have public writing. They didn't seem to need it. It was all right. The Vedas were memorized. So it wasn't the first thing on his mind to think, okay, let's put us all into writing. You know, it was just like, I will, I will talk to you like Socrates talked to Plato. He didn't write it down. He talked to him. He spent a lot of time explaining, thinking about it, asking questions, and asking them how, so now you explain it to me. Let's see if you understand this, and so forth. That was his teaching method. And uh, he, I guess he realized that, well, you know, it's, it's, you know it was going to be preserved, and they'll preserve it in whatever way they can. Yeah. Ajahn, uh, this is so interesting. Um, one, so to lay out a bit of the landscape you just did, um, you believe that the, uh, the Greek monks were possibly writing down elements of the suttas as early as 150 years after the Buddha or 400 years or so? I would say much earlier than that. So first of all, uh, Alexander invades uh, 325 BC. The, the, one of the weird things about Buddhist history is like, when was the Buddha, what are the Buddha's years? You'll find Chinese uh, ideas that it's 900 BC, outrageously not possible. You will find, well, the Sri Lankan uh, ideas is 650 BC or something like that. And then our, the standard for the last, in the West for the last, I don't know, few centuries was 563 to 483. You remember those dates? He lived 80 years, 563 BC to 483 BC. Died in 483 BC. That's that's sort of the date on the Thai calendar kind of thing. The Sri Lankan calendar is, is significantly different than the Thai calendar, by the way, for what year is this in the Buddhist year? Uh, the best sort of scholars, European scholars now, their dates are 480 to 400 BC, that he probably died in 400 BC. There's a lot, there was a substantial conference in the, I don't know, the 90s or something like that, where <clears throat> most of the Buddhist scholars got together in Germany and they, they put out their dates, you know. So the there are some as late as 380 BC. Now that would have been just 50 years before Alexander uh, invaded. Uh, by the way, 
When Alexander got to India, he was very much surprised to find, guess what? Whole villages of Greek Greeks there. <laughs> yeah, because the Persians had uh, resettled Greeks there. They, the Persians would take Persians and Greeks and so forth and put them as settlers. This is, what, this is how North America was done as well. We, <clears throat> we, we gave free land away in areas to, <clears throat> to settlers to place them there as parts of the empire. So the British Empire came across Canada and so forth and, and the U.S., and uh, they would ship settlers there. You've got to settle the place to make a claim to it, so forth. So the, the Persians did the same thing. <clears throat> they brought Greeks across to northern India, or what we call Afghanistan, or it's, it's all mushy. You know, it's not, they're not, those are contemporary names. So they settled there. So when Alexander got there, there were already Greeks there. So there's, Absolutely no reason why Persians and Greeks could not have entered the robes very shortly after the time of the Buddha. It was, there's no reason why that uh, couldn't have taken place. And uh, it might not even have been worthy of mention in the suttas. Like, why would you mention it? It's just like, you know, yeah, these guys are the Yavanas, you know, and these, it's, there's the Persians and the, you know, etc. So, the Aryans. <laughs> Um, so I would just say that culturally, the, it's just overwhelming odds that the first writing of the, of this, of the Pali Canon, and especially, especially the, any of the analytical aspects, the Abhidhamma, the early commentaries were, uh, prompted by Greek, uh, Greeks. So you see that they're insisting to write down the, the Septuagint, the, the, the seven factors, the seven books of the Old Testament about, the, about um, 300 BC. They're insisting that the, the, the Jews write this thing down in Greek. You know, we want to know what, what the books are about. They're not just asking, they're, they're telling. You, you write this down. <laughs> We're interested in this. So I, that mindset... Because why would it occur to Indians who weren't, weren't writing at the time, why would it occur to, to do it? it? It's probably the impetus of Greek monks. Now, and we have the first, the earliest actual transcription is on the birch bark things. That's the earliest historical one. But that may be centuries later. We may come up with, we may find stuff that's earlier. We're, there's all kinds of stuff buried in Afghanistan. You know, there's huge monastery buried in Afghanistan that the Chinese, uh, the Chinese are opening a copper mine there. They came across this huge buried monastery under the sands of Afghanistan. And there's something like several thousand artifacts in there. And they've, uh, a lot, they've given, they gave a 10 year period to get them out of there. Now, of course the wars, you know, endless wars are going on in that region. And they have very little financings to do this. It's the international Buddhist community has not stepped forward with adequate funds to excavate all of these things. These are buried, um, and there is possibly the earliest uh, suttas are buried in there. You know, so I think the time's running out on that. It was a ten-year moratorium before the copper mines, and the copper mines are like open pit mines. They just take everything out of there. <clears throat> so it's possible we could still encounter some earlier actual evidence of scripture um, yet. So this is I, what I'm interested in. I'm not like, it It doesn't affect the validity of the Pali Canon or anything like this. Uh, I'm, I, have, I take the conventional view that the Dhamma has been preserved in the Pali Canon basically and everything. It's just that uh, I would like to re reintroduce everybody to the fact that uh, Western European monks have been in it right from the very beginning and are responsible probably for the written documents and some of the preservations of this as well, and including some of the analytical stuff. So that may be, they've influenced it in some ways by writing. Yeah. In, in 
researching this uh, this huge shift, this technological shift um, in communication um, media, you know, at that time from from memory basically to to writing. I'm curious if if it's informed your thinking about this these new shifts that are happening as we're going from from writing from books to what well, you are really um, re- certainly at the forefront in terms of Dhamma circles of the shift into video or shift into podcast audio. And I'm curious if you have, in looking at the shifts that happened, I mean, Socrates was predicting a huge loss of, of memory. You kind of hinted at it. Um, but yeah, what, what are your thoughts about? Um, it's more of a, a contemporary question, but this is at least as uh, monumental a shift um, into video and audio as as that was at the time and um but you're actively engaged in it as as we are um and i'm curious what your thoughts are about that yeah i I think it's uh, actually a restoration of memory because uh people prefer to listen to the spoken word and if they can see you as well so this is the way the buddha was they were sitting right in front of you talking to you and the nuances of the human voice the expression you know this is uh, the r- written word cannot do certain things. You cannot, so emails, you know, you, 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 you get all offended and the guy didn't mean any offense whatsoever, you know, like, because you can't read the tone in the, in, the, in the writing, but you can hear it in the voice. So this is actually a return. This is why I prefer this. I, I do write, you know, uh, sometimes what's w- weird is that a few of the books I've written are actually transcriptions and uh, elaborately re-edited transcriptions of talks I've given. So I delivered in in uh, spoken word, and then we we edit it and change it into the something that works in the written form afterwards. But I prefer to do this. Uh, the oral delivery, um, uh, and I think it's closer to the nuances that the Buddha could have uh, done. You know, you 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 uh, you feel uh, you you communicate. You you understand a person, the tone of their voice, the way they speak, the language they're speaking. Are they speaking in your vernacular? Are they from your? Are they one of your people? So I'm a Western monk. So. A lot of people are going to relate to me that couldn't relate to an Asian monk somehow, um, etc. Even even uh, people born in Buddhist cultures coming, they they migrate and so forth. And uh, when they start listening to Dhamma talks by Western monks, they start to th- think that's very useful. <laughs> Actually, I forgot all about that. I only went to, I only heard rituals. I heard chanting in Pali and so forth. But he's talking about stuff that affects my very life. So this is the importance of fully, uh, tra- you know, first of all, you got to read the, the Pali Canon, you got to listen to it, you got to practice and everything, and then you internalize it, and then you uh, reproduce it with similes. Now, this is the one of the key ways the Buddha taught is similes. He's referring to people's knowledge and experience that they already have and he's saying, it's like this. It's like how you make a, feel, uh, a, a channel of water to a field. It's like how you plant rice. It's how a be, uh, an elephant behaves. And they're thinking, oh, I know about elephants. Oh, I see. That's So you have to produce the similes from your own culture. I say so it's like the unified field theory, you know, how hard it is to reconcile quantum physics with macrophysics, you know about that, right? So <laughs> it's just that, that, that's, that's a mind blower, right? So here's what it is, you see. <laughs> so I have to internalize it and then put it back, especially with uh, oral delivery, yeah. And also the expressions on the face and all of this kind of the hand gestures, all of these things, yeah. Are, this is an important rest. In a sense, we're re- restoring something here. Yeah, I hadn't realized it till just today. Actually, um, something else you can see with video is just, you know, the mental or I guess the physical correlates of a well-trained mind. I was watching one of your videos, and I have this plugin which lets me speed it up 
up to 15 times speed. And it felt disrespectful to like speed you up past like seven times speed. But you at seven <laughs> times speed, you are very still. You're, of course, your mouth is moving, but like your head, you, you convey and you, your affect is one of, of stillness. And, and that's something you can see and just almost pick up on subconsciously in, in videos. So I hadn't noticed that before. I thought it was interesting. Yeah, one uh, reflects on delivery. And of course, I'm from the, you know, I was a classical musician. And part of your training, especially as a classical musician, is like, how do you, how do you, uh, your facial expressions, your bodily expressions while you're playing this piece and so forth. So you're, you become conscious of these things as well. The Buddha is very obviously very conscious of the, he, of his, his facial expressions, his mudras, his gestures. And of course, this is, by the way, uh, we missed one gigantic thing. All of these Buddha statues, where are they from? They're Gandharan. They're from the Greeks. They're Gandharan sculpture. There is no evidence of any Buddha statues at all in the suttas because there is no, they don't do uh, three-dimensional carving in India at the time. And where does it come from? It comes from the Greeks. They, they immediately wanted to carve the Buddha and the, some of the disciples in, in marble, in three dimensions. And now everybody in Asia uh, is bowing to Buddha images. There were no Buddha images at the time. There's nothing. You know, you, you see the introduction in the Vinaya of uh, people arrive and they bring incense f and flowers to the monastery and and can and uh, candles light or lights actually like probably we were um, uh, coconut oil lamps. What should we do with them? The Vinaya. The question is to the Buddha: What what should we do with this stuff? <laughs> incense and flowers. Because that's what was brought to shrines, you know, like, so they, he says, well, put them in the corner. Actually, that's all he says. He, there, there is no altar to put them on. Put them in the corner. The lights you can use. Take it to your kuti, whatever. But there is no candles, incense, uh, flowers, statues, none. Zero. These are all accoutrements and uh, not mentioned whatsoever in the suttas, and it's, guess where they came from? The, it's three-dimensional carving, that the Greeks were the preeminent civilization for this for the longest time. You can't match the Greek sculpture for millennia until half, well into the, you know, it's probably the 16th century that Europe starts to be able to capture things in stone that the, the Greeks were able to do. So we have writing and the visual uh, representations, the art. So again, the Buddha doesn't have anything to say about art, does he? Because what art? There's no painting, there's no, but is art a viable method of communicating? So this is an issue we should, look what's behind me. This is a, that's a, a silk screen. Uh, we communicate through art and sculpture and and video, etc. All of these things. This is how we communicate. And is it okay? Is is art off? Is that taboo or what? Obviously not, because the whole thing is saturated with art. And it goes as soon as you go outside a, a forest temple, into any of this, the village temples, it's covered from stem to stern with paintings. All of the stories of the Buddha. So how do you communicate with an illiterate society? Stories, orally delivered, and representations of scenes from the Buddha's life. So there's paintings. And so these art and these are just mediums of communication. And most of them are introduced, probably introduced from the, from the West, from Greeks, Europe, you know, sculpture, writing, and perhaps the painting as well. And they are just throughout all of Asia, all of the countries 
adopted these things and used them for transmission of Dhamma. So, Longpur, um, if the sort of effects of writing a teaching down include um, things like a systema, systematization of the teaching in the Abhidhamma, um, I imagine there's other interesting knock-on effects you could point to, perhaps the accumulation of teachings in large libraries like Nalanda and therefore perhaps, you know, lending itself to the quick destruction of Buddhism during the invasions. Um, you could also point to the fact that actually when things are written down, there's almost more ability for them to uh, change and perhaps that could speak to the splintering of the tradition a few centuries afterwards. Um, so I'm curious about that, uh, but also this idea that the Greeks, there was this bridge um, through the Silk Road that early um, and Greek monks were, the teaching was traveling to the Mediterranean. Um, I'm also really interested in what significant aspects of what we've, hen you know, before considered Western quote unquote culture, uh, especially Christian monasticism and Christian thought, which of those uh, elements do you think were deeply influenced by, by Buddhism? Um, so yeah, sort of the, the ripples in, in both directions of that bridge I'd be curious about. Yeah, um, I'm, it's hard to imagine that Christianity just uh, developed the idea of monasticism out of the blue. They were really, very aware. Uh, you can see that some of the bishops, uh, the early Christian bishops, uh, were aware of the of Buddhism. Um, they were very well educated, and of course, the New Testament is set down in Greek as well. So, I mean, all, anybody who's literate would have known about this because it's brought back with the whole description of the Indian society and their various philosophers were brought back and speculated on. And the fact that they had organized into philosophical groups um, and, and that they had whole groups of celibate uh, monks, uh, you know, monk, this uh, word monk is, we're just borrowing this. It means one, a mono, it's from mono, uh, monastic. It means one who lives alone, you know, who is solo, you know. And uh, so this, this really, that organizational structure didn't occur till much later. There were a few people who are not, of course, from the New Testament, they were, Christ says, uh, look at Peter here. He is the rock I shall build my church upon. And who is Peter? He is a person who, who never has known a woman. He has never had sex in his life. <laughs> and he's, the, he's, I'm going to build my church on him. But it turns out that very few people just on a freelance basis can maintain the, uh, the celibate life. Now, Greek philosophers had tried this before. I don't, Christ is, is also aware of the Greeks. The Greeks are in, in Israel. Uh, Christ probably spoke Greek as well, read, was aware of Greek ideas, certainly Aramaic and Greek. And uh, they, they had tried, there, there were individuals who tried the celibate life and they found it very, it was very challenging. There were very few people who could manage that kind of thing determinedly. Uh, but the idea that you could have an organizational structure that would support this way, um, then uh, then that's a different level of the game. And so they, they, they had heard somewhere, they may have buried in their subconscious, you know, that we're boring from the Buddhists. Um, but th this occurs to them to make a, a training school for hermits, you know, a, a training school for, for monks, really. And that you can live as a community for a period of time, and then you're, you're able to function as a hermit. You see this in, in St. Benedict as well. Benedict himself is a, is a prodigy. He goes off and lives in a cave for s several years, all by himself, just meditating, never coming out. He comes out, and he says, this is a fantastic thing, but very few people are going to be able to do this. What if I organize a little community, say 12, because 12 disciples. Let's make a little community of 12, and I'll train them. And 
after a certain period of time, you sh after your training in community, you should be able to function as a hermit, you know, or, or a solo person. So that's, that's Benedictine monasticism. Um, he probably heard ideas like this. It's not new. It's in the Greeks. Uh, the Greeks were talking about the value of contemplation, celibacy, and all this kind of stuff, and withdraw from the senses. It's nothing new. The Buddhist ideas would have been sweeping around as well. So this is probably, there are influences on this. Yeah. So probably we covered some of the essentials here. Um, and uh, advice and show business always leave them wanting more. So uh, we... We will probably have another conversation sometime uh, exploring these. But I hope that you start to think, just a minute here, let's get this, let's restore this early participation by European monks in the Sangha. This is not, we're not newcomers to this at all. We've been there from the beginning because we recognized, the, the Europeans recognized, this is a monumentally enlightened teaching. It is very high. They recognized, the Greek philosophers recognized, they were, they were pushing towards this as well. I read you that little thing. It could have been a quote about Nibbana from Plato. They were on this as well. And then it all got buried under a very heavy Christian cloth for 1,500 years. So we're just kind of lifting the cloth off and trying to remember our history. What, where were we before? Remember the Greeks? Remember? <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're kind of learn, restoring our history here as well and getting it away from the prejudice about that East and West are two different things, etc. They're not, they're not two different things. Yeah. Well, Tanujan, thank you very much. Yeah, just curious. I mean, definitely leaving us wanting more. Uh, are you actively writing a book to this effect? Or will you- I'm, I'm gonna write an essay uh, because, you know, when you, re when you research this, there's all kinds of, do a couple of dozen scholars on, that love the scripts, you know, all of the scripts, the Kurosti and the, the Barami script and the this and the that history of this and the, the writing and the, gen now we have this new thing, the genetics. And this is a total, Game changer. And by the way, this is problematic with Indian nationalism. These ideas are, you will just find a, a, an attempt to rewrite a re, revisionist history because of the threat. They're, they're trying to reestablish, I can sympathize with, they were dominated by the British Empire until 1948. And they're trying to restore their sense of identity and they want gen, that all of this wonderful stuff came out of India and, and Sanskrit, the Vedas and all this kind of stuff. But actually speaking, when looked at closely, probably, not, not just probably, but definitely not. The Vedas, in fact, are probably coming from uh, early Aryan, like they're actually from the steps of, this is why you find this incredible blending of, of myth all the way from the Vikings up north, Valhalla and so forth, all the way to India and to Egypt and so forth. Where, who's, who's, where are these coming from? Uh, and they presume, it, well, we, that's our th thing. But no, they probably came in uh, from other places and they know genetically they can show this, some early sources from out, way outside of India and so forth, from any of these things. And so... Th this, these myths and ideas about the, nat the stories about the nature of the universe and who runs it and all of these things and what happens when you die are just s smeared all over uh, in an in a endless moving way of all over Asia. And of course, probably brought some degree into North America because they're, they're coming across the Bering Ice Bridge and bringing cosmology from the steppes of Asia as well <clears throat> into North America. So we have to appreciate that this is that nobody owns these things; that they're they're amorphous ideas. Yeah.
Long Poor, it, it actually seems very significant in a few ways. Um, first, there is a, a sense of almost solidarity and that softening of that division between East and West, even 2,500 years ago, it, it does resonate in, in the heart a bit and sort of inclines towards a, a vision of a bigger family, which I, I do appreciate. Um, tracing the threads of these early this early bridge into the Western tradition is fascinating. Um, and I'm also just the sort of piece you threw in about the uh, Sakians possibly being of Persian descent is, is interesting. One of the most significant things for me in what we've spoken about though is just the pinning of the advent of writing uh, in the suttas to several centuries earlier than we thought, which can cast it as a causal factor in so many developments in Buddhist thought, including Abhidhamma, uh, certain you know strands of debate, the perhaps the fracturing into Mahayana and Theravada. Um, I think a lot of things can be laid at the feet of writing that we haven't been able to if we think that it only came about in first century AD. So I'd be I'll be fascinated to see where this goes. And thank you for taking the time to share it with us. Really. All right. I will say one more thing. <laughs> now that you've mentioned something. The the so-called council, the fourth council, which is supposed to have been in Sri Lanka that uh, wrote down the entire Pali canon, so-called in Pali, <laughs> um, a, an equivalent council was set up in uh, the, under King Kanishka in uh, the far north. And they, they wanted to put the the write the whole canon down too. And they were a competitive school because you remember that the the schools broke out into various competitive things. And the Mahayana scriptures, the sutras are in uh, in Sanskrit usually. And that was, they, and I think Greek monks were involved in that too because some of the Greek monks were on the Mahayana side of things. They were interested in different ideas and they, uh, those were written in Sanskrit to differentiate them from the Prakrit, the Pali, and to give them a, some sense of authority because the, the Vedas were considered a little higher class. You know, you're not speaking the folk language. Now, the, the, apparently the Buddha says, you know, in the, in the suttas, he, he, the, these twin bro, these brothers come to him. They want to set the canon in San, They want to translate the canon into Sanskrit. You remember this? And he says, no, use the language of the people. Now, whether this is back edited into, into this later because of this, this tension where some of them are using Sanskrit and they're coming up with new ideas that are not, they're, they're, where'd you get that sutra? You know, that, that's, that's really long to begin with. And it's very, doesn't, that's not in the Pali canon. You know, we don't remember that one. So this might have been backdated into it, saying, "No, I, you don't set it in Sanskrit. S keep it in the vernacular of the people." This, this, by the way, and might be for another discussion. This is a very important point in terms of: uh, Are we allowed to recite the 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 Padimoka um, things in uh, in the vernacular? Or do we have to recite it in Pali? Like, aren't we violating the very rule of the Padimoka by insisting on a on an, on a particular language, namely Pali, rather than the language that we speak in reciting the rules? <laughs> um, so this uh, this is another area we can we can perhaps talk about uh, again, which is very very important because these are. A lot of these things are cultural. They, they've, they're formed culturally and haven't been questioned for centuries and need to be re-examined and brought to light. So you, they, we have to say, wait a second, is, didn't he say you're not, you're not supposed to insist on any particular language? Because this is actually reversed by Buddha Gosa. He says, meaning that you, you can't insist on anybody else, any other language than the Pali. <laughs> But obviously, when we speak here, we're not speaking Pali because nobody understands it. Uh, we, if I gave a Dhamma talk in Pali, 
nobody would understand me. So this, uh, you know, uh, the Buddha is a sensible man. He spoke in the language people understood. So I, I presume that that means that you speak in a language that people understand, yeah, etc. So this is something, another area that we, we can discuss, you know. <clears throat> Don Jean, yeah, thank you uh, so much. Uh, Lumpur, excuse me, gosh, it takes me a while to cross over. Just, uh, yeah. <laughs> I do like it, I do like it. Um, and yet, uh, thank you so much for your time, and we would love it if you could come and, and visit us in Seattle at any point. It's not that far a drive. Um, right. I, I do intend to uh, make an excursion sometime. It's always tricky finding the, the time slot and everything, but I'd like to... Well, it's a nice opportunity for a little road trip and seeing Seattle, and uh, I'd love to talk to Richard Solomon as well. I'm going to try to communicate with him ahead of time. Um, but at least to to see these things with the naked eye and so forth. And then, um, I mean, you can see them online, of course, but uh, it's a nice, you know, direct experience as well. Okay, and if I, uh, I'll, I'll certainly tell you if I'm going to be down your way, yeah. Please do, Tana John, and your your friendship of Birkin and, and of you has been really helpful coming here, so thank you. Yeah, good. I, I wish you great success with your search for land, your land quest. <clears throat> yeah. Everybody out there, help these guys. <laughs> Sorry, I did, almost did an exit, X graphic. <laughs> okay. Sorry.